Good morning. How are you doing? Is it not a beautiful day? I know it's cold, but this is the first of many cold days. Well, one of many cold days, but it's beautiful, just beautiful out there. I love it. Did that mousetrap thing scare you? It actually kind of scared me a little bit. I was doing it last night. I'm like, man, I hope I don't get my fingers smashed in this. I was practicing. Every time, it scares me. I've been doing that for years. Would you turn with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to read verses 12 and 13 today. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you you speak to us to lead us into all truth, and I pray, God, that that would happen right now. Lord, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. You tell us that. I pray, God, that we would love you and you would edify us. Open our eyes and our hearts to you in this moment, in this time, as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. You ever watch someone work? You just get fascinated by watching them work? Old saying is, I love work. I could watch it for hours. <laughs> I used to sit uh, in my office watching someone work. Down, down the way at a muffler shop. It was down the road on the, on the opposite side. And I was fascinated because he would, he would weld. And I would just stare, not at the bright light, because it's like brighter than the noonday sun, but at all the sparks coming off of it. It's amazing. Like all the danger, all the, the, the molten metal flying off. I didn't even know this guy. I was like, this, this guy is a stud. I'm not going to do that. I don't know how to do that. So I, I called. I called a friend of mine who welds all the time. And, uh, and I said, I'm looking at all this danger flying around for this job that this guy does. And I asked him, you do this. Does it ever hurt? And he, he, he said, well, I suppose sometimes, like if you're in an awkward position and you're stick welding and a piece of molten metal falls in your lap. What? A piece of molten hot metal falls in my lap? If a piece of molten hot lava metal falls in my lap, I'm screaming. I'm out of there. Look, I'm screaming. I'm running to my boss, and I'm telling him, this particular activity is potentially unsafe. (laughs) To do otherwise is to invite suffering. To sit there is to invite suffering. How many times do I just want it easy? Right? Don't we, don't we want to do important things? Things that last, but don't have any risk. We, we want those things. Or we still want to do it, but we don't, we don't want to risk. We, we spend so much time in our lives avoiding pain. It's very normal. Avoiding suffering. It's a natural response. But sometimes pain falls in your lap. It's a natural reaction to recoil, right? We feel the pain and we say, whoa, and we step back. We we experience suffering and say, whoa, we step back. And we step back from the world and we step back from God and we step back from each other. Because it's very, very normal. When we experience affliction from the world, or, or when we experience 
affliction, from our own flesh in temptation. Or as we suffer alongside someone trying so desperately to walk them to the Lord, and it's hard and it hurts. It's really easy to ask the question, is it worth it? Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though something strange happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. You know, when I think of a king, maybe some words come to mind when you think of a king, but I think of power. I think of pride, I think of privilege, I think of possession, I think of ease. You know what I don't think of? I don't think of poverty, penalty, persecution, and suffering. I don't think of those things. When I think of a a king of kings coming down to suffer at the hands of his subjects, That does not compute. How can a king of kings come down and suffer at the hands of his subjects? That is exactly what the prophet Isaiah actually said would happen to the one that God sent to redeem his creation, to be their savior. Do you remember that? This is all the way back in Isaiah. And it says, Isaiah 55, or sorry, I'm sorry, 53, verses 3 to 5. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, And he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. You know, Jesus indeed suffered at the hands of the world, didn't he? Can you imagine the the constant criticism from the Pharisees? They, they, they thought that they were wiser than this Jesus and had more experience than this Jesus and, and were more learned than this Jesus who came out of nowhere. But he was run out of town. He was plotted against. His own people took him to a cliff and tried to throw him off the cliff. Do you remember this? He, he was beaten and he was tortured. He suffered in his very flesh. Despised and rejected by the people that he came to save. But you know what? It wasn't always like that. It wasn't always like that. He had epic victories too. Do you remember the victories? Do you remember it? The people fed. People saved. Miracles done. Epic healings. Strongholds cast down. Demons cast out. Hearts changed and minds healed. Bearing the affliction was worth it for the victories. It was worth it. Jesus says to us, you're going to have victories. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit works through you. You get massive victories. You're also going to have seasons of suffering from the world. Jesus suffered from the world. He says you're going to experience the same thing. Not all the time, but you can expect it. He says in John 15, 18 to 19, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I have chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Or John 16, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. The world, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. There's something funny there. Did you catch it? Be of what? That doesn't seem right. It'd be like, make sure you hang in there. No, no, no. Be of good cheer. How? I don't think I'm getting that wrong. How can you be of good cheer in that if living as a Christian invites hardship from the world, how can you be of good cheer? How can you be of good cheer in that? If, if living out your faith means something's going to come down on you, possibly, if living out your faith means maybe you will not get that promotion you've been so excited about, like, if living out your faith means that you might struggle with your friends and your family, they might reject you because you refuse to give up the truth of God for the truth of the world, which is a lie. How, how can that be joyful if you're punished? Because you refuse to lose your integrity for the sake of someone else's profit. How can that be Joyful, it's really easy to question. Is it, is it worth it? You know, if there's one person to look to, to see why they did something, it's probably Jesus. Why did Jesus do it? Why did he do it? Listen to Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the what? For the what? The joy? That's great for Jesus, though, right? Because, I mean, Jesus was raised from the dead. Right? He's sitting by the throne of heaven. That's great for Jesus because he was raised from the dead. What about me? By your faith in Jesus Christ from God... You were raised from dead into life. When he rose from the grave, you rose into life. You have the same joy. It is there for you. We have such joy set before us. Just listen to 2 Corinthians 4, 17-18. This is powerful. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it might not feel that way. is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen, they are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, you always have a choice. Did you know this? You always have a choice. You can end this affliction that you experience at the world's hands and from temptation and with walking others closer to Jesus, the, the three areas that we experience a lot of suffering, you can end it right now. In fact, that's what the devil whispers in your ear. He says, if you're experiencing hardship from your faith, just deconstruct your faith. It's easy. If you're experiencing hardship from following Jesus, just stop following Jesus. Give up the truth of God, adhere to the truth, from the world, and they will stop afflicting you. They will stop. Jesus even says it. If you were of the world, the world would love you, but you are not of this world. It's a choice. But what do we give up? But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. The things that we see now, the things we see now as affliction, they might be painful for a little while, maybe even more than a little while. They have no comparison to the unseen weight of glory that's waiting for you. This, um, this standing firm in your faith, that glorifies the name of Jesus above anything this world can offer and any trials that you could ever encounter. Worth it? 
doesn't even come close to the same universe of hope that we have in hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. There, there's no comparison. Worth it doesn't even come close. Jesus had this joy in mind. He had this joy in his obedience. He had this joy in the obedience even when he suffered in his temptation. Do you remember that Jesus was tempted just like you and I? To every extent that you've ever faced temptation, he experienced it and probably more. Do you remember that? Just listen to Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest, Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but as what was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Do you remember part of that temptation? Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterward, he was hungry. That might be the understatement of the decade. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones may become bread. You fasted 40 days. You're Jesus. You're not, by the way. Fasted 40 days. Devil comes up to you and says, You hungry? He wants some bread? You bet he wants bread. He is hungry. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. He experienced that. He was hungry. Jesus, you have the power inside you. Just take up your power. Take up the power that you laid down in obedience to come here to save these pitiful people. These Wretched wrecks who don't deserve it. Just lay down your obedience and take up your power. It's being withheld from you, Jesus. You deserve it. Just like Satan said to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember? Take up the fruit. It looks good. It's good. Just, just lay down your obedience and take up the fruit. You know you need it. In fact, it's being withheld from you and you deserve it. Take up the fruit. You bet Jesus was tempted. If I had fasted for, I can make it two days. Not, I can't even make it two days. I barely make it two days. If you came to me after two days of me fasting and you told me all you have to do is break a seemingly insignificant rule and I will give you a double Western bacon cheeseburger. I'm suffering in that temptation. It is real. If there's suffering and temptation, here's the question. If there's suffering and temptation, why don't we just give in to the temptation and end the suffering? Why don't we just give in to the flesh and satisfy the flesh? Why? It's an illusion. The flesh is never, never satisfied. Ever. It just leads to more. And more. And more. It's, it's an illusion. It cannot be satisfied. Given to the flesh, you'll keep giving into the flesh. You'll never be satisfied. But more than that, more than that, it'll enslave you. But this is exactly what a lot of the false teachers around the time of Peter who's writing this epistle tell us. He says in 2 Peter chapter 2, 18 and 20, just, just listen to what he's saying about the world around you right now. Just listen to this. 2, or 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 21. For when they speak great, swelling words of emptiness. Sounds great. Full of hot air. It's, it's like, uh, it's, it's warm vanilla sugar hand soap. Smells fantastic. You can't eat it. It tastes awful. 
I have tried. I thought maybe, well, nope. Ain't gonna work. They speak with great swelling words of emptiness that mean nothing but make you feel real good. They allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Do you see the world in this? Do you, are you seeing it? Do you see the world in this? For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse than the beginning. It would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. We don't turn back. You, you don't turn back. You might have the, the illusion of satisfaction, the illusion of freedom. You might satisfy your heart's desire for a moment. Oh, but the end is worse. You're enslaved to the very sin that Jesus Christ died to free you from. That's the end. Imagine if Jesus didn't resist the temptation. Can you imagine that? If he was there with the devil, he's like, yeah, dude, I'm hungry, you're right. You're right. It's too much. Could you imagine if he didn't resist it when Peter walks up to him, Jesus' greatest triumph was also the greatest tragedy for the world that time, right? Imagine Peter coming up to Jesus and saying, Jesus, Remember this, Matthew 16, 22? You don't have to go to the cross, Jesus. Do you, do you remember that? When Peter came up to him and he said, Jesus, don't go to the cross. This shall not befall you. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, you know what? You're right, Peter. I'm God. I don't deserve this. I'll find another way. Or maybe that, that conversation that Jesus had with his Father in heaven in the Garden of Gethsemane went a little bit different. And instead of Jesus saying, not my will, he stood there and he said, no, my will. I don't deserve this. That's their problem. I didn't do this problem. I'm God. Let them deal with it. But he didn't say that. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew 26, 36 to 44, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Does that sound like suffering to you? It sounds like suffering to me. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, you could not Watch with me for one hour. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, a second time, he went away and he prayed, saying, Oh, my father, this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it. Your will be done. And he came and found them sleeping again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away and prayed a third time, saying the same, same words. He was afflicted to his very soul. Can you imagine the temptation to want to avoid death? The temptation to want to avoid the punishment for sin that was not his. 
to face the full wrath of God the Father as he turned his back on his son. Can you imagine that? He's suffering in his, in his very soul. He's suffering right here. You can hear it in his voice. Expecting the full wrath for us. But your will. The temptation had to be brutal. But your will. His joy in his obedience to God outweighed the cost of his suffering. Because God had a plan. He knew God had a plan for good. And we can be joyful too. You know that even when we struggle in the affliction of our own temptation, God understands that. He just said that in Hebrews. He understands it. He also makes a way of escape. What a good God we have. This is not only do I get it, I get it. I'm with you. Someone who makes an escape for you is right next to you. He has planned it for you. And he says, I've made an escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. It might not feel that way, does it? Sometimes I feel like a temptation. I have only dealt with myself. No one else can possibly understand what I'm going through. It's so powerful. Haven't you been there? I can't avoid this. There's no way. But God can. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We can be joyful that every time your desire to submit to God's will in your life is greater than your desire to satisfy your flesh. You can be joyful. You can be joyful that every time that happens, that God is working out something wonderful in you. Did you know that? Just listen to James chapter 1, 2-4. to four. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. It builds you up. It builds you up. Perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Standing fast in your faith and obedience to God, even in temptation, when it hurts, is absolutely worth it. And Jesus, who suffered for you, who suffered for us, he considers us absolutely worth it. We were worth suffering for to bring us into relationship with him. Do you remember him weeping? It's the shortest verse in all of, all of scripture. Jesus wept. Right before he raises Lazarus from the dead, his friend, he looks upon the state of death and he weeps. Shouldn't be that way. He's come to bring life. Right, right, right before he goes into Jerusalem, he looks down on Jerusalem. He says, how I have intended to gather you and shelter you under my wings, but you were not willing. Do you remember that? He cared so much. Paul, he writes this epistle, this letter, and he starts stating in 2 Corinthians all these things that he's had to go through. Do you remember that? I've done this and this and this and this and this. And he ends with something very peculiar. 2 Corinthians 11, 28, sorry, 23 to 28. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I have received 40, minus, 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleepless, sleeplessness often, in hunger and in thirst and in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me Daily, my deep concern for all the churches. As if he capitalizes 
all of his sufferings with his greatest desire here. What's his greatest desire? Jesus, Paul, are willing to suffer so that people would walk closer with Jesus Christ. Did they always suffer? No, but they were willing to suffer so that people would walk closer with Jesus Christ. An earnest desire to lead people closer to the Lord. That's what you're called to. That's what we're called to. To walk alongside people even though it hurts. Sometimes. In our desire to lead them closer to the Lord. Because that's exactly what Jesus patiently did with us. Do you remember 2 Peter 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 9? The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. As some consider slackness. Because you might wonder, why is God waiting? Don't you see the world around here, God? Why are you waiting? Just come on down. He is long-suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's long-suffering for us. Patiently, bravely, enduring the offense and the injury of his people so that they would have an opportunity to know him. Long-suffering with those people. Part of the reason the end is not here is because he is waiting for people to know him. He is not purposed. That's the word there. He's not purposed that any should perish, but that all come to repentance, to turn to him and not turn back. He was long-suffering with Noah as he gave Noah the chance to build the ark before he flooded the earth. He was long-suffering with Lot as he waited patiently for Lot to leave the city before he destroyed the city. He's long-suffering with his people. Did you know you're called to be long-suffering with others? That is not fun, is it? Long-suffering is more than just patience. It is patience. It is. But it's also bearing the risk of being hurt. That's what it is. You're called to do that with the people who are in your prayers, your hearts, your minds, the people you walk alongside with. Because caring for people, did you know this? I'm sure you do because you've been hurt before. How many people, don't raise your hand. Everybody's been hurt. I'll raise it for everybody. You've all been hurt. Yeah, you don't have to raise it. I'll raise it for everybody. You've all been hurt. Because when, when you care for people, it invites that, doesn't it? It invites it. Does it always happen? No. But there's always a risk in being open with somebody else. Always a risk. And it can be absolutely wonderful and sometimes heartbreaking as you walk people closer to the Lord. It's both sides of that. Wonderful and heartbreaking. But we do it because just like Jesus, we're willing to endure it because we're not willing that they should perish. The question is, 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 is it worth it? So I asked my friend, I was there on the phone, stumped by the... Um, the molten hot lava metal falling in one's lap. And I said, so wait, if molten hot lava metal falls in your lap, do you, do you get out of there? Do you, do you scream? Do you run to your boss and say, this particular activity is potentially unsafe? <laughs> he said, no. You hang in there and you finish the well. You finish the well. But isn't it distracting? Yes. Doesn't it hurt? Sometimes. Doesn't it burn? Once in a while. Doesn't it leave scars? Occasionally. How can you stand it? Brandon, those things are part of the job. It doesn't happen all the time. But when it does happen, you sit there, you finish the well, 
and you hope you don't catch on fire. That's what he said. Because finishing the weld is important. Finishing the weld is beautiful, and finishing the weld will last forever. Finishing well is important. Finishing well is beautiful, and finishing well will last forever. There's nothing worth holding on to more than the love of your God and His truth in the face of this world. Nothing worth holding on to more than your love for God in the darkness of temptation. Nothing worth holding on to more than leading people closer to Christ, though it might come with a cost. Nothing. It does not compare to the eternal weight of glory that's waiting for you. You're filling up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. That's Colossians 1.24. As you take the gospel to other people and live it out in their lives, as you show them the care and the compassion and the love of Jesus Christ that he had for you, that you now live in their lives, it is absolutely, even though it might be painful, sometimes worth it. No one is past God's power to redeem him. No one. You might not see what you do now in other people's lives, but it can have eternal benefit for them, for you. You might not see it. It's worth it to give them the same victory that you've experienced in your life. Because if you've truly experienced that, it's something you do not want to keep to yourself. You share that with people. I know a lot of you are suffering. In every group, there's people suffering. But I know a lot of you aren't right now. There's a season of not suffering. That's fantastic. If you're in a season of not suffering, be sensitive to those people around you who actually are. Like if, if you know someone who is suffering from living in a fallen world who has experienced death or loss or in sin, reach out. Reach out to them. If you're not suffering right now, you're called to bear a burden with other people. Pray with them. Listen to them instead of just trying to fix them. If you are going to give advice, you be sure that you open the word before a word leaves your mouth. If you are suffering, you are not alone. You are not, Even Jesus, when he suffered on the cross, was not alone. He had his friends right there, and they were suffering with him right there. He was alone one time as God turned his back on him, and the full weight of our punishment rested upon him. By his stripes were healed. What that means is that he was forsaken so we would never have to be. Alone once so we would never have to be. That's what he did. So we wouldn't have to. He was crushed so we could be counted as the body of Christ. So we wouldn't have to be alone. They did suffer. They watched their friend die. But they, they saw all the promise of, of him apparently bleeding on the cross, bleeding away, but it didn't last forever. In three days, they rejoiced. In three days, they rejoiced. Maybe you're suffering from your struggle from choosing this life with Christ. It happens, right? We lose friends. We lose family. They drift away or they just don't want us anymore. Maybe you're struggling with that. You're suffering. Maybe you're suffering in temptation to maintain that fake persona that you've developed that you give to everybody else like you do on the fake book. And it's not real. But deep down inside, you don't really feel important enough to be valued by other people. And so there's that temptation to keep it up, to not really let people in. The lie that we shared, do you know the lie that we shared to the world? The lie that we shared to the world. Hi, how are you? Good. Granted, what people mean when they say, hi, how are you, is it's good to see you. I understand that. There's translation there. It's very tempting to keep up that look. Very tempting. Let people in who you have grown to trust. Be real with the people you have grown to trust. At least with them. Maybe you're 
struggling with that person that you have tried to show Jesus to for the millionth time and they're just not listening and you're suffering in that because you don't know if you can handle it anymore. Question, is it even worth it? Know that your suffering is hard. It really is. But it is not forever. Reach out to God. He is your ever-present help in time of need. Reach out to the body of Christ that's around you, that loves you. This, this glory that you have waiting for you, this hope that endures past anything that you can, you can deal with right now, the, this eternal weight of glory is there and promised to you for your sake of the walk with the Lord and walking other people closer to Christ. Sometimes it hurts, but not all the time. In whatever the case, it is absolutely worth it. Let's pray. God, we're all humbled by the fact that you considered us worth it. God, it's, it's humbling to know that in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you say it is by grace that we have been saved through faith, not as a result of works, because there is nothing that we could have ever done to earn what you've done for us. God, it's humbling to know that the King of Kings would suffer for his people at the hands of the world and temptation and for us as you walked us into relationship with you though we could do nothing on our own. Thank you, God, for humbling yourself to come to us. I pray, Lord, that as, as we leave and go about our lives with our families and our friends and our co-workers and our community and our world, Lord, that we would step out and be willing to walk people closer. God, I pray that in, in the affliction, though it's not all the time, that we face from the world and temptation and from each other, and from people who are walking closer to the Lord, that we, we understand how worth it it is to love you, represent you, walk closer with you, and lead others to do the same. Thank you for being the same God. It does not change. We can always, always count on to be right beside us in every affliction, in every pain, with every tear. We thank you that you are who you are and you have loved us. What an encouragement that is to know your word is true and to have you with us walking it out. Thank you for your mighty gift and excellent, excellent love you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.